Hello and welcome to Hot Topic. My guest today is Andrew Percy, Conservative MP for Brig and Goul, since he took the seat from Labour with a majority of 5,147, 11.7%, at the last general election in 2010. Andrew Percy, welcome. Thank you for coming in. Pleasure. Uh, first of all, I want to talk to you about the uh, issue of floods in your constituency, and you've been very active recently in talking in the House about uh, flood defences. Yeah, I mean, we had uh, hundreds of homes flooded back in December uh, across 11 villages uh, in my patch across North Lincolnshire and uh, uh, East Yorkshire. So, uh, you know, people were fairly reasonable in our area. They understand the nature of where we live and the nature of the event we had. But obviously, naturally, people want to know moving forward that the flood defences are going to be of a sufficient standard to withstand changes in the climate and all that. So you know, we've had a, a lot of work going on in Parliament about that. Uh, well, you've been get getting, a, getting quite a lot of money invested in these flood defences. £5 million recently from uh, North Lincolnshire Council. Uh, £5,000 compensation, up to £5,000 compensation for people who were affected by those floods. And the central government has made a commitment to invest uh, around £100 million in flood defences generally. Uh, there's, there's not a lot more you can expect, is there? Well, I mean, the, uh, you know, the flood defence budget's about £2.2 .2 billion overall um, uh, in this spending period. So there's a lot of money going in, but of course, you know, with rising sea levels, which is what we're seeing, and in the Humber that's going to continue, then we need funding to make sure that those defences are uh, you know, ri uh, raised sorry, in line uh, with the rising sea. So uh, that's what we're after. I mean, the, the Environment Agency have a plan for all of this, but... Uh, it's going to cost £320 million just to do the defences on the Humber over the next decade or two. Um, so the key thing is trying to bring that funding forward, um, given what we've seen in the Humber in uh, recent uh, weeks and months. So that's what we're all working together as MPs across both sides of the Humber to try to achieve. Uh, Lord Krebs of the Committee on Climate Change uh, reported just the other day that uh, we must ask ourselves how we prepare the country for flooding, uh, which the models suggest will become more common. It may well be the case that there are areas that are too expensive to defend. Is part of your constituency in that in that King Canute no, I mean, territory? I, I don't agree with that. I mean, we've had a, a lot of debate since the flooding of, um, you know, whether it's uh, urban versus rural. And actually, the reality is, especially around here, actually, you have to protect the rural areas to protect the urban areas. And particularly, of course, we have a lot of industry. So, you know, South Ferriby is a prime example. Um, you know, it's, it may only be a small community, but actually one of the major roads in the area uh, runs through there. You've got the cement works there, which has suffered millions of pounds of damage. So actually you have to defend both. I mean, there are always opportunities, as we've seen at Orkborough Flats, for some uh, flood storage in certain locations and these are, you know, attenuation um, schemes. That may be uh, acceptable in some places, but generally we don't, we don't, we can't have a uh, we can't have a uh, you know split between urban and rural. We've got to think of it all as one. Is there not a bit of a, a caveat emptor though? If you buy a house on a floodplain, especially in our area, especially at your end of the Humber, uh, there where there is a great deal of low lying land on the Humber and around the Trent, if you if you buy a house on a floodplain, uh, not very far above sea level. You get what you get what you can expect. Well, I think people I mean people have been very reasonable about that. I mean a lot of people who were flooded in, you know, communities like South Ferriby and have put Reedness in East George, which is also in my patch and in Burringham, you know, said, Look, we know where we, we live, we know we live in and you know, a lot of my area, the Isle of Axon, was drained by the Dutch. It's a, it's former marshland, you know, it's we know what we know where we live and we understand that. But uh, which is why people haven't, I think, generally been uh, you know, screaming and shouting about this. They understand we had an exceptional event. However, they also know they live in an area which is protected by flood defences and that there's a plan to improve those flood defences. So people quite legitimately have bought their homes knowing there are flood defences. They expect those flood defences to remain in place. They don't expect the environment agency to come along and knock them down so that they can use their uh, land for... Um, uh, flood attenuation. Um, so, so, so we know where we live, but we all can also expect to be protected. Uh, we're talking of the Isle of Axholm, there you've been quite active trying to encourage uh, better uh, mobile phone coverage. Um, again, th if one does live in a very remote part of the country, one can't really expect to be to be covered by the, the, the phone network. Well, you, I mean, I think you can actually, because actually people who live in rural areas contribute more on average in taxation and get less back in public services, which is why it's been perfectly reasonable to expect um, the taxpayer to help fund the spread of um, broadband to those areas. And there's money also being, public money being available also to improve the mobile network. Um, you know, and actually, but in, the, in this situation, what we're saying to 
um, the companies is, um, you know, actually there's a lot of customers here. Um, there are a lot of them. You know, there's there's 12,000 um, properties on the Isle of Axum, so it's an area with a, a, a lot of people. Will it be taking any public money? Uh, well, it is doing for the broadband rollout. For the mobile rollout, probably not. Um, uh, and the broadband rollout, of course, is, is funded in a partnership with the council, the government and BT. Um, but actually, the mobile phone companies I've met with um, have said that they're planning to make upgrades anyway across much of our area in the next year or so. So, so we should see improvements, actually, driven by uh, Vodafone, O2 uh, and 3 and the other companies themselves. And, and for perfectly good commercial reasons. They, yeah, of course. Got money and, you know, we, w we want things to be done commercially. But similarly, you know, when that can't happen, uh, particularly when it's around infrastructure, because mobile phones are now infrastructure. It's not just, you know, I, I want to have a takeaway nearby. Well, that may not happen in a tiny little village. Um, but actually, you know, mobile phones now are, are part of the infrastructure of the country. People require them for their work. Um, you know, more people are expected to do work at home. You've got to have the infrastructure to support that. Uh, you've been talking about wind farms recently. You've said uh, that the uh, farm near Keedby is a scar on the landscape. Now, the, the wind farms might be, uh, you might argue about whether or not they're uh, important to the future energy needs of the country or of the region, but certainly important to the local economy around here on the Humber is uh, the renewable energy industry. Able UK wants to build a uh, wind turbine servicing centre on the South Bank. Associated British Ports doesn't want to give them the little patch of land uh, that's, I think, on the edge of your constituency. Uh, that that they need the, mm -hmm. the so-called kill home triangle. Yep. How is this to be resolved? Well, I mean, uh, two things is obviously there's a difference between offshore and onshore wind, and what what what's what we're looking at for Able and also for Greenport in Hull is to service the offshore industry, which we're all fairly enthusiastic about. There's a whole debate about whether it's worth the money and the subsidies. As far as we're concerned, um, it's it's good for local industry, so we'll support it. Onshore wind, we've always had a view locally that we'll take our fair share and no more, but there are parts of my constituency which have been completely encircled by but, wind turbines. But your fair share is going to be a bit more than the fair share of somebody who lives in a very sheltered, leafy, um, dell-filled part of the country, because you, your, fair sh your part of the country is a perfect place for wind farms, so your fair share is going to be a bit more than everybody else's. Uh, well, it, it has been, unfortunately, and our argument would be actually you can't just dump them all in one location, and it's very nice well, for people... you can people dump them in the place where there's the most wind. Well, sure, but it's not always the case where it is the most windy actually there are other factors which come into it but but actually you know it's not you know if we have that argument then we can have that about every energy um, source in the country and you know and there's plenty of people who are anti-fracking when it's in their backyard um, but you know very pro having wind farms in other people's backyards we've always taken a sensible view on whether it's fracking whether it's the coal-fired power stations the gas-fired power stations we have around here or wind farms we're willing to do our bit and have our fair share what isn't acceptable is to have people in communities completely in circle uh, by wind turbines at every, uh, w every which way they look. That's not acceptable. What would be your view or your constituents' view if having those wind turbines there, uh, that electricity that was generated was free or very much cheaper local ele generated electricity for your constituents and that their power bills, uh, they could visibly see those power bills going down as a consequence of having that local, um, those local turbines. That would, just, that would destroy any element of NIMBYism. Well, there'd it? still be, and there's nothing wrong with being a NIMBY. I mean, I think if people have a perfect right to say, I don't want that in my backyard. I mean, you know, there are plenty of people running around saying, uh, I think you should have that in your backyard. Um, well, I think the people who are actually affected have more of a right to say what goes on in their backyards than people from outside the area patronizing us about what we should and shouldn't have. So, but in, uh, but in terms of actually the... I, um, I think, I think so, for, forgive me, Andrew, we're going to have to stop there for a break, but right, we can continue, no, no we continue with this after the break. Um, thank you very much for watching. Please come back in a couple of minutes. Now, uh, recently you were saying in the Scunthorpe Telegraph uh, we should apply the same immigration rules for the EU as we do for other countries. Now, it seems that the rules we have for other countries are fairly lax. The leader of your party, the Prime Minister David Cameron, has an Australian nanny and a Nepalese uh, woman who comes in and helps out. Neither Nepal nor Australia are, <laughs> are in the EU. Of course, but if those people can come in here and fill uh, jobs that we can't get people to fill here, then there's nothing wrong with that. We're, you know, we need a, a certain you level. Mean that of nobody wants to be the nanny for no, the prime well, minister's well, child. Possibly not. I don't know. I wasn't involved in the recruitment process. But you know, we need an immigration system that actually. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm talking to Andrew Percy, Conservative Member of Parliament for Brigham Gould. 
Andrew Percy, mm -hmm. to talk about a few national issues now. Uh, recently you were saying in the Scum Talk Telegraph uh, we should apply the same immigration rules for the EU as we do for other countries. Now it seems that the rules we have for other countries are fairly lax. The leader of your party, the Prime Minister David Cameron, has an Australian nanny and a Nepalese uh, woman who comes in and helps out. Neither Nepal nor Australia are, <laughs> are in the EU. Of course, but if those people can come in here and fill uh, jobs that we can't get people to fill here, then there's nothing wrong with that. We're, you know, we need a, a certain you level. You mean that of nobody wants to be the nanny for no, the prime well, minister's well, child? Possibly not. I don't know. I wasn't involved in the recruitment process. But you know, we need an immigration system that actually applies um, a standard to those who come here. And of course, non-EU immigra uh, immigration uh, people who apply for that have to fill a uh, skills test. They also have to. Uh, have an English language test before they can come here uh, and of course they can't just tip up here um, without a job offer uh, and, and get access to the benefit system very quickly which of course EU immigrants can't. So my argument is we need to have the same system for people wherever they're from. I don't like this free movement of labour across Europe, it's not working and it needs to uh, be reformed. Well firstly why in that case would anybody bother to be a member of the EU if you don't have that advantage over uh, uh, well, people from other, from other parts of the world to move yeah. within the EU well, from country to country? What, what, what's, the, what's the difference under your view of, d of being in the EU or out? Well we need to have free trade and, yeah. and of course that's what we want to maintain and actually the free movement of labour when it started wasn't actually a terribly bad thing because you were talking of countries of similar economic uh, levels of development um, uh, so you weren't going to have people moving largely for uh, purely economic reasons. But why else but does anybody move for instance from uh, Northumbria to Cornwall or from uh, Cumberland to Devon well, that, that uh, because you know, for, for economic reasons. That, if there's yeah. a job uh, in uh, a brig which somebody from Krakow can do better than somebody from Grig can do and they're willing to charge less for it then free market economics suggests that that movement of labour is, well, but is but a very only, Adam Smith idea. The only logical conclusion of that though is that you have a free movement of labour around the entire globe and that of course is barking well, mad. Well, you why? have to have an Why you say well, that as if that's, the, that's the, the, well, the absurd, the absurd because consequence because of your argument. Because it's so when, well it's actually a real problem for us in this region the internal migration we have in that we can't actually sustain sustain people always in our region uh, because they're drawn into the big urban centres, particularly into London. So you are seeing that within the UK. It's not actually necessarily in those countries' interests if you were to uh, take away the brightest and the best from all of those countries. But you're uh, not representing people in, uh, in, a, in a parliament well, in Warsaw or Bucharest. No. We, you, we, it, we, it's in our country's best interest if we get their best surgeons and their best taxi but, drivers. But uh, well, that's fine if we're getting the best people to fill jobs that we can't get people to fill here. That's fine, but that's not just what you get with uncontrolled immigration. You get, you can have everything you uh, uh, expressed with a controlled immigration system. However, with an uncontrolled immigration system, you do get benefit tourism, and you get people who are coming to this country who aren't coming to the country for the right reasons. And we can't control that. I just want the system. I don't want to cut off immigration altogether because that would actually be pretty stupid economically. I want a system that's controlled and treats people fairly. It's madness that people from the US and from Australia can't come here. Uh, and often fall foul of the immigration rules who speak perfect English, but somebody can step off a plane or a bus from Romania without speaking a you'd word like a, of English like a, well, you're and a, have the full right to work here. That's not right. You're, you're a, a, a historian, so you'll, you'll know what I say when you're, you're advocating an Austin Chamberlain style empire first. Uh, English speaking world uh, is, is more a, welcome I, here than. I'm actually not. I'm actually saying we want a system that treats every country equally. What we have at the moment is a system that. Uh, precludes people who have the same skills and who would very easily fit in here because they have the English language skills and come from countries of very similar cultures. Uh, they're precluded and instead uh, we have an advantage system for people who actually come here without necessarily knowing a word of English. That cannot be right and on I'm certainly my constituents don't think that's On an right. issue uh, c also continuing with Europe, um, Nick Clegg, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, your coalition partners, mm -hmm. is going to have a television debate with Nigel Farage, the lead leader of UKIP, um, uh, to try to fight that issue out. Why is the Conservative, why are the Conservatives willing to go up against Nigel Farage and fight that out? Is it because the Conservatives su base support uh, is so similar to the UKIP base support? Well I think, I mean I think the circumstances of that, I can't remember who challenged who. Um, but of course what you've got there is somebody who's passionately anti-EU uh, and somebody who's passionately pro-EU. Um, so I think that's where that, uh, that's come from. I mean there is a question about whether or not there would be leadership debates of, uh, between all the party leaders. I'm not actually in a general election. Um, so I'm not actually convinced the leadership debates 
are necessarily where we should be going in this country. We're not a presidential system. Well, we're quite I a presidential really system. Well, but we, we shouldn't be because actually it's about time we got back to a system where we elect our parliament to be a, a legislature first and then to be a, an executive second. I don't like this idea of a presidential style of politics in the UK. And I think the leadership debates in the last election actually didn't really enhance the uh, debate in the uh, election at all. Well, you wouldn't because it was seen to be such a success at the time for Nick Clegg, for the leader of another party. Well, I mean, it didn't and, and turn out to be in the actual result. Well, but, well but you no, had he didn't expect to win a majority, but it did turn out to be in the results and that it gave him a seat in the cabinet because it meant you had to but settle we for had, a coalition. But we had, well, I mean, the Liberal Democrats actually ended up with less uh, MPs at the last election than the time before. So despite the boost from Nick Clegg, it did tail off. But actually, that whole, should we be having elections turned on... Um, on, on, on something so false as just uh, you know a, an hour's debate. As the personality of the man who's going to have his hand on the button, yeah, but, or the woman for but, that matter. But, but it wasn't about that, was it? It's actually because Nick Clegg stared down the camera a bit better than uh, 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 Gordon Brown or David Cameron did, so a lot of people thought, oh, well, he's like, talking directly to us. It's so unpredictable. Do you not actually, think David Cameron is very well, good at, sco at speaking to the public? Well, it didn't, it didn't come across as well as Nick Clegg did, clearly, because if you look at all the polling of who won the debates, Nick Clegg was seen to have won the debates. But actually, was one it was all presentation over substance because there wasn't actually people didn't um, uh, say Nick Clegg had won the debates because oh. he'd won the arguments. They said he'd won the debates because he just looked better. That's on going Canada. back four years now. At present, uh, present private grief within the Conservative Party. The party seems to be dividing between those who support uh, George Osborne. Uh, and those who support Boris Johnson as uh, successors for the leadership. Is it not a little yeah. premature? The Prime well, Minister is a 47-year-old yeah. man. Is it a little, not a little premature but to be speculating to on his say, successor this yeah. soon? Well, I read these things in the newspapers as a member of the Parliamentary Conservative Party, and apparently we've all picked our teams already, and we're all having this debate. I have to say... And what's your team? Well, I don't, it's not a debate I've had with any colleague in Parliament. I mean, beyond the thing, beyond what we've... D debating what we've... and discussing what we've seen in the newspapers, I can assure you that we do not spend our times in Parliament deciding who's going to be our next leader. It's not even an issue nobody's thinking about. Um, but, the, you know, that, I'm afraid those are stories that well, come through the media. These, these stories, these, well, these are stories that are coming from Boris Johnson and George Osborne. Well, they may uh, come in from one or two people close to them. I can tell you the uh, vast majority of us, if any, I, I'm not aware of any, in the Conservative Party are not worried about would the next be, leadership. Would perhaps. it be necessary, if you were not to have a majority government in the next Parliament, would there have to be a new leader of the Conservative Party? I think it becomes very difficult for the uh, prime. I mean, you'd have to see what the results are, but I think it becomes very difficult for a leader if they fail two elections running to secure a majority. I well, think people you're saying wouldn't. that David Cameron lost the 2010 election. Yeah, well, he we failed. Didn't, we mm. didn't win it. We didn't win a majority. Um, so, the, the, I mean, that's a fact. He didn't win a majority. Um, uh, and if we if we don't win a majority again, uh, I think it becomes very difficult for a leader to continue. We'd have to see what the circumstances are at that moment in time. One of your problems is, is, that, is that Parliament doesn't have a great deal to do at the moment. The Queen's speech has been delayed because nobody can put anything in it because most of what the coalition agreed, the coalition agreement is, is largely achieved. So you're sitting there in Westminster twiddling your thumbs. Uh, what would happen if there were, uh, at the next election, another coalition where the Liberal Democrats made a deal with the Conservatives and then you sit there for another parliament without anything to do because you've already done it all in this parliament, everything yeah. that you could agree on anyway. Well, I actually, I voted when we set fixed terms uh, for parliament, I voted uh, for four years rather than five. I don't like five-year terms, so I would actually prefer the four-year term. Inevitably, in the run-up to a general election, a parliament tends to do less. I mean, it's still doing some very important stuff. We've got the care bill coming through parliament. Yes. You know, we've been had a lot of discussion about the flooding at the moment. Well, I was on my feet. Have you got a year's worth, week. though, to go? Well, yeah. there have will be. Years I mean, there's, worth there's, of a, there's plenty of legislation to come down the line. But it's never as important in those last in the going, last year. I'm going to have to wrap it up there, Andrew it's Percy. Fine. I'm very sorry. Thank no you very worries. much. Thank you. Thank you very much to Andrew Percy, um, Conservative MP for Brig and Ghoul. Uh, that's all for this hot topic. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Goodbye. Thank you.